Thank you so much for being here today. If you were not here at the beginning of the service, we did pay our power bill, but overnight there was some type of surge, loss of power, air conditioning units, and we have what seems like hundreds of units on this campus, uh, dozens at least. Some of them are not working, especially here in the auditorium as is present. So we want to um, reduce the time here. I'm not gonna keep you long, but I did wanna talk to you for a few minutes and I'm sorry for the darkness, but we're just trying to keep the sun out to bear, uh, bar as much heat as we can just to speak about what's been going on, not just yesterday, but really for the last few weeks. Um, when we looked at the series that we wanted to do in June, it was Greatest Hits from the Old Testament and now we're in Greatest Hits of the New Testament. And I have been drawn, I'm doing the, all those sermons in uh, July, and I've been drawn into looking at uh, some things that touch politics or where politics touches the church and the church of Jesus Christ has a high and holy responsibility to respond. So, so we did that a little bit last week and I wanted to do it again today. Uh, the sermon title, and I'll, I'll, I'll pray this is what the Lord would have me to do next week, but the sermon title is Religion and Politics versus Christ and the Gospel. Uh, I want to talk about cancel culture and how one of the first examples of cancel culture came in Acts chapter 4 and 5 when uh, the disciples were told no longer to speak in the name of Jesus. And uh, they were told that not once, but twice, three times. And they refused and said, we must obey God rather than man. And what you're telling us to do is impossible. And there are times in the Christian life and experience when we have a responsibility to stand for things and stand against other things. And the church needs to be aware and sensitive and not a tenure nor to get involved as well in political waves or tidal waves, especially if they are conflicting with the Word of God. So I'm going to put that on hold until next week, and I hope that you'll come. I want to keep you just a few minutes because I know that uh, the heat can make you very sleepy, and I know from firsthand my preaching can make a lot of you very sleepy, and uh, I want to be sensitive to that. Um, Read this last week, Romans 13, verse 1. Paul writes and says, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. So government, like marriage and family, is an or, or, or ordained uh, aspect of culture or society that he created. The authorities that exist have been established by God. On into verse 2, consequently, Whoever rebels against the authorities rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on wrongdoers. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. Last week, we touched on the lesson where Jesus said, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's and render unto God that which is God. Next week, we will look at um, this issue of cancel culture. When a culture tells you to be quiet and to shut up about the gospel and do not go forward with the gospel and do not bring your biblical ideas into the public arena, well, we have to obey God rather than man. And so we want to talk about that and what did the early church learn and what did the apostles, the church leaders do? Again, next week. Um, my, what a, uh, I guess about a 13 day period we've had as a nation. We uh, experienced the debate and that led into an absolutely necessary uh, 
press conference and led to an absolutely necessary speech for the president. And then the candidate whom usually got its most of the, of the headlines, be it pro or uh, con of his position, kind of went away for a while until what happened in uh, Butler, Pennsylvania yesterday. I did not see it when it actually happened. I saw it maybe an hour later. Yesterday, we had a wedding here for Bill and Dee. We married them right here yesterday. Scott did the ceremony. I got to pray over them, and the room was air-conditioned, and it was <laughs> wonderful. Remember those nostalgic days at East Side back in the good old, remember the good old days at East Side when we used to have air conditioning? They got married. And for those of you who don't know, Bill is our building superintendent. And I wrote him a text last night and I said, Bill, go have fun with Dee on the honeymoon and forget about us for a while. But when the power went out, his lieutenant here, Tanner, called Bill on his honeymoon and said, Bill, the power is out. <laughs> I expect to get a letter of resignation from, <laughs> from the church for Bill and Dee. We have a funeral this afternoon for Joy Hunt, who was a part of our school and church, her husband as well, longtime member. She's with the Lord now. And we also, uh, uh, on Friday, uh, there was a funeral for um, Mike Palmer's mother out at First Baptist, or what we call uh, Salmon Valley Baptist Church in Salmon Valley, Idaho. And uh, we sent flowers, but we also sent as our representatives to the funeral and to care for the church that week, Trey and Whitney, who were on staff there for years. And uh, just got a nice note from Whitney saying that she was praying for us today. She's there, and uh, I, I suspect Trey may be preaching today. I don't know, but that's kind of what we, we do. Now, just to tell you again, and I'm going to let you go in a moment, I said, guys, I, I only want to take five to 10 minutes. And they looked at me and said, uh, which means what, 20, 20 minutes? And I said, yeah. <laughs> what we normally do here is we take a passage and we go verse by verse. If you're our guest, our visitor, our visitors today, that's normally what we do. But just some thoughts on where we are when it comes to, to government. My, my buddy, Jeff Cranston, who preached here a few weeks ago, pastors down Low Country Community Church, Jeff and I were on the phone about this yesterday and talking about how, how would we handle it with our congregations, this situation, and, and uh, we talked about what, what is it that we should, we should do, and we did. And then he sent me this morning, if I can find it here, he said, this was, he said, John, this is what I'm praying today, and you know Jeff and love him, that are part of our Eastside family. He said, I'm praying this today, and I love this. Lord, may we be kind so we don't grow mean, tender-hearted, so we don't grow hard, forgiving, so we don't try to get even. I think what we saw yesterday, given the closeness of those now what we believe to be assassins' bullets from 130, 40 yards away, and hit the, pres the former president's ear and We've seen some pictures of the whizzing of a bullet going by his head. I thought, well, I think what we saw yesterday was, uh, was the providence of God. Uh, he's turned this way looking at a screen like I would be looking at this one. And as he is turning, bullet goes by. If his posture had been this way, just another inch back, we would have seen a, a recreation of the Sabruta film. Uh, back when John Kennedy was assassinated on the streets of Dallas, Texas. So the Lord had protected him, and uh, this morning I read a release that he gives God credit for saving his life. It's been a very difficult time for our president, very difficult time for him and his family. And wherever you are on the political spectrum, I would just want you to understand that our responsibility at Eastside, if you're new to us or if you're not, if you're part of Eastside, but you're not tuned into this, we feel it is our responsibility to pray for all who are in authority over us. And so we pray for our president, the vice president. We, we may not agree with the administration now or the administration to come or the administration that was. 
but these are people that God has allowed and God has ordained to be in positions of leadership. Uh, I would encourage you, as I would in the sermon that I have prepared and will preach next Sunday, I would just encourage you to be engaged, to be aware, know what's going on, make your decisions to whom to vote for based on biblical convictions. And remember, as much as we are engaged and involved, it's, 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 it's the Lord who already knows. Daniel says it's the Lord that selects the presidents and kings. And so we trust the Lord with all of this. I am troubled as someone who grew up in the 1960s to see what I think those of us who remember those days see a, a bit of an echo of that happening right now. The violence. Um, and I, and I, I just think we just really, instead of pointing fingers at each other and which is, which is going to happen because again, politics, I think we need to have things pointed toward ourselves and pointing toward others to how we can help and how we can serve. While we're grateful that the former president was a survivor, there is a gentleman I understand who has passed away who received one of those shots. And I think there are two more that are at least of early this morning in uh, some type of intensive care, serious care in the hospital. I'm also grateful to not only pray for those that are in authority over us in elected positions, but those that are in appointed positions. The Secret Service is an example of that. Police officers are examples of that. And we need to pray for them. First responders are an example of that. We need to pray for them. Let everyone be subject, the Bible says, to governing authorities. And when government steps over line and says, Christians, you can't do this. You can't proclaim Christ. You can't meet. You know, we felt some of those tensions during COVID on one side or the other. Believe me, I heard from both. Believe me. We felt some of that. Um, in Canada, where there is not free speech, in case you think I'm bashing Canada, uh, I served and ministered in Canada a couple of profile positions for a decade. My wife and I were a permanent residents of Canada until the Lord called us back here to Eastside. But in Canada, there's not free speech and has been, it's limited speech. The church that I pastored there had a, still does, a national television ministry. And any time that I was to speak on a subject of controversy that I knew would go against the grain of the culture, political correctness, I had to make sure that I didn't raise my voice, that I didn't perspire, that I didn't look angry, that I, that, that, that I was precise in the words that I used, had to run it through a couple of lawyers because there's not free speech there. It's worse now than it was. In fact, the, I think the Canadian government was more brutal to churches there, especially in Western Canada, than we were in the United States. But even with that, you pray for your government. You pray for your government leaders. And you thank God that you still live in a nation where you're able to meet freely and you're able to say these things. There are some countries that we cannot talk about Jesus. We can't meet. That's the religion aspect. And then there's certain countries where the politics are such that are Marxist and Leninist and atheistic and so secular that you cannot speak of Jesus. So with everything that is wrong and everything that is troubling and everything that's discouraging and add to that just the pressures of life of filling the tank and buying the groceries, um, this is still a wonderful place to live. And I don't want you to get so out of joint that you'd really do something you'd regret. There are peaceable ways 
to disagree. Civil disobedience is done without violence. It doesn't destroy property. It doesn't hurt people. And what we're called to be in times like this and in all times is a peaceable people. We are to live at peace with all people. Now, there's some of you that are wondering if God might be calling you into some type of public service role. That may be from anything of serving on a school board to a city council to a county commissioner. We even had a dear brother here who's put his name up for sheriff in our church. He, he did not win, but he was in the arena. And we're called to be salt and light. And God's calling to be engaged and be involved and to raise money and, and, and get involved and knock on doors and do those things. I encourage you if you do it in a peaceful, gracious way. And if you can do it and support a candidate that would not cause you to compromise the good news of Jesus Christ or the clear truths of God's word when it comes to life and marriage and gender, if you can support people who will support you in your freedom to exercise the worship of Jesus Christ, go for it. I encourage everyone to vote. And I won't use the joke here, vote early and vote often. I won't use that, all right? That's not appropriate. But vote, get involved, be engaged. But all of that needs to be in the framework, and I'm, I'm done here. All of it needs to be in a framework that you can't let your passions be overly political. The answer to human beings' problems, the answer to the sin issue, the answer to violence in our culture, the final solution for that is not political expediency. It is found in the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. And that's why here the gospel must be primary. I conclude by maybe you're thinking, well, John, what, what matters most? Well, I, I, what, what, what has been going on matters. I, I don't want us to sit up, put our head in the sand. I talked about that last week. And if you're not sure where I'm coming from, go online and listen to Latin, last week's sermon and be here next week for next week's sermon. I don't want us to put our head in the sand, but, but yes, what, what, had, what is going on in the last 10, 15 days, another presidential election, another national election, it is important. But the most important thing from an east side perspective, this church that's been on this corner since 1961, the one thing that continues to be the main thing is the gospel of Jesus Christ. the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And I want to ask you in a moment as we step out of this warm auditorium into a hot day, I just want to ask you, do you know this Jesus as your Savior? You see, 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ came to this earth born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, never sinned, went to the cross to die for our sins, the Bible says that he who had never sinned, never known sin, actually became sin on the cross. He shed his blood and had his body bruised and broken, skin broken for us. He died for our sins. It's a cross that I should have been on, you should have been on, but Jesus took our place. He died for our sins. His body and his blood, a sacrifice. Three days later, he rose from the dead and he lives today and forevermore. Jesus, while he was here, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. I just want to ask you, do you know Jesus? All you have to do is cry out with all your heart, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I can't forgive myself, can't save myself. Only Christ can do that. So please forgive me of my sins and come live within me. I receive Christ as my Lord, as my Savior. Give me the ability to follow you. I hope you'll do that.
Now, the other one thing, one thing I want to do, I want to ask our elders and if any of our elders, spouses as couples or individuals, pastors on staff, the Daryl Scotts, Tims, if I, I, I think I saw Tim, if y'all would just come and stand up here in the front, would you just spread out along here? Elders, if you're here, well, and again, it's dark and I'm sorry, I can't see all of you. Spouses of our elders, if you would come forward. And, and if you have a prayer need, a prayer request, Wayne, why don't you, Wayne, take it over there. Wayne McCurley, would you and Anita take it over to that aisle and Scott, Daryl over this aisle that we got here and same way over there, Tim on that corner. And then just get right here. And here, here's what I just want to have some ministry time. Babby's going to play. If, if you're uncomfortable and you need to leave, I understand. But you may feel like your life right now is under attack. You may feel like you are being victimized about something. There's something in your life that's troubling you, weighing you down, breaking your heart. I just want you to get up, and these are leaders in our church. The, 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 these are the people who I'm accountable to. These are the people that see us through the, the good and the bad. And I love all of you very much. I love you. I want you to feel free to come down and talk to them. Say, this is my need, my prayer. And they'll pray with you. Nothing embarrassing. You're not joining the church. You're not signing up for anything. But man, if you came into this room with a heavy burden, you need to unload that. Let's take the last few minutes of this warm room and this service together to have some ministry time at this altar. I'm just going to ask you to remain seated. And if you stand up in the middle, people will let you by. They'll move their knees this way or that way. They'll, be back. they'll let you come. If you want someone to come with you, they'll come with you. Let's just have some ministry time. Father, the next few minutes, would you do in this room some healing, some caring, some ministry? Touch hearts today that may need the Lord Jesus, others that need a special touch from you today. Some in this room, death has touched them this, this week. For others, it's illness. For others, Lord, it's abandonment. For others, it's job loss. For some, it's a diagnosis. And the test hasn't gotten back from the lab. For others, it just may be a marital tension or a parental concern. For some, it may be Lord, what do I do next? What is your will for my life? God, we just give this few moments to you and we ask that people will come. Not motivated by me. Not feeling pressure from a pastor. But simply motivated by your Holy Spirit to bear a burden in prayer with the leaders of our church. In Jesus' name. Now, my Savior.